Okay, we'll have a look at texture analysis. Um, these are the topics. I think I've added a few other things in here, but we'll come to them as we go through. Uh, okay, the role of texture analysis. Texture refers to those qualities of food that can be felt with the fingers, the tongue, the palate, or the teeth. Foods, of course, have different textures, such as crisps, crackers, or crisps, crunchy celery, hard sweets, tender steaks, chewy chocolate kick, chip cookies, or sticky toffee, and many other examples, of course. Texture can also be a measure of food quality. The texture of food can change at this start for various reasons. If fruit and vegetables lose water during storage, they may wilt, and a crisp apple might become leathery in the outside. Bread can become hard and stale on storage. A range of texture analyzers are available, with many pros for different food, foods. Uh, click on the image of a pr probe kit uh, for a video. Uh, this uh, machine here, Brookfield BT3, is the one we have in the food lab. Uh, you notice this one for squeezing the bread. You may have squeezed the bread in the supermarket. Well, there's a machine which will do it for you. Um, probably more accurately, of course. So, texture analysis provides an objective measure of the characteristics of food. Uh, there's a graph there of chewing, chewiness uh, based on texture and, and a sensory subjective measure. Um, as we'll see, chewiness has a specific definition of which more in a little while. Such objective measures can be used to validate subjective measures such as them from consumer testing. Okay, texture and eating. Um, there are distinct stages of chewing and swallowing. There's a video on that later on in this presentation. In most cases, it's carried out with conscious, without conscious thought. But some people, for those with issues perhaps around dyslexia, uh, problems with swallowing, and again, more on that later, the process can be difficult and close attention needs to be paid to the texture of the food, plus for the various reasons we've already discussed. Um, so here are some technical descriptions of food mouthfeel. Many of these are familiar words, but in all cases they have specific definitions allowing them to be measured. I'm not going to read these out. You can do them for yourself, pause the video, start thinking about which foods these descriptions would apply to. Uh, so there's some more. Again, do the pause thing if you need to. And yet more. We continue on. There are quite a few of these. Uh, please a little exercise. Stop the video and have a think about foods that fit these descriptions. Uh, you may find that food, some foods perhaps fit more than one description, and that's fine. So I'll pause the video for a moment. Okay, I'll assume we're back. Uh, here's just a few examples. So juicy oranges and chewy tofu and greedy and coarse salt. Okay, so texture profile, ana profile analysis, often referred to as a two-byte test. It's got two-bit test in the notes. Uh, I'm not going to change that. Here, the texture analyzer mimics the act of chewing food in which two bites are involved. Uh, Kim's used a very good video on using the Brookfield BT3 anal analyzer. It's in Panopto. Uh, so I'll click on this image here. You might be need to log into TU Systems to access it. Uh, also, click on the image of the texture analyzer that will link through to Brookfield's website. Uh, so, as I say, see Kim's video if you haven't already done so. During the TPA test, a probe descends and makes contact with a sample. When a mini minimum trigger force is achieved, the probe descends for a set distance at a specified speed. Uh, the probe then returns to its original position and waits for a specific, specified time before making its second descent for another reading. Uh, the wait time between the first and second compression test is important. It must be the right light length, not too long or too short. If too long, it will have, allow the food material to fully recover, uh, making the first and second re reading appear the same. Alternatively, if the wait is too short, it will allow time for the material won't allow sufficient time for the material to re recover sufficiently. This is all organised in the way the instrument is set up. Again, Kim's video goes through this. Uh, so here's the process and stages. The first bite, um, the probe descends, makes content, contact, etc., etc. And the second bite, uh, very similar process. Uh, we notice the uh, force applied is, is force that needs to be applied is less this time because the food has been deformed by the first bite. 
Crispy Foods produce a characteristic texture profile, and the software uses this to measure this particular characteristic. So things like crisps and biscuits. Similarly for hardness, uh, there's a hardness probe cracking a biscuit of some sort. Note here that the maximum force which is achieved at the first bite again. Um, a sensory test is may describe this as a degree of crunchiness, crumbliness or bitterness. So cohesiveness, uh, two, two by test still works on this. This is the extent to which a material can be deformed before it ruptures. Uh, so there's an example there of a spiral pasta. Again, the system performs this calculation based on working out the ratio of the two areas under the curve at the point where the pressure is applied. Uh, stringiness, elastiness, bounce back ability. When the deforming force from the probe is released, how quickly does the food regain its original condition is what we're interested in here. So there's an example there of a lasagna or something similar. Uh, springiness, uh, the classic example of a springy food would be marshmallows, you squeeze them and they return to their shape. Springiness is the degree to which the food returns to its original height after being compressed. Again, it's calculated as the ratio of the two distances here rather than the areas. Chewiness is a calculation based on gum, uh, product of gumminess and springiness. And some Werther's originals there as an example. Okay, adhesion and adhesiveness. Uh, are two key characteristics to be determined by the two by tester. We'll have a look at this later on in the case study on foods for dysphagia. Uh, this is food sticking the surfaces essentially, including the palate and other mouth parts. Uh, so there's an example there of uh, addition on the previous slide and adhesiveness on this slide. As usually, if, you, if you've got the presentation, have a look at it or just pause the video. Okay, probes for texture analysis. Uh, we have a range of probes which are illustrated there. If you click on the uh, if you click on the, in the image, it, yes, it, it, sh it should take you through to uh, some resources on probes. Obviously, you need a particular probe for a particular food, so the probe you use for a biscuit will be different from the probe you, you use for yogurt, for example. Okay, so here's a case study. Um, dysphagia, as mentioned earlier, and is difficult in swallowing, which may be the consequence of a range of medical conditions, including stroke and throat cancer. Now... This is not for the open book resource, so it should not be included in it. It's just general background. Foods for dysphagia are technically sophisticated, meeting standards both in nutrition and texture. The latter do ensure that they are safe for the patient to consume. If the texture is too high, it may cause significant and, in some cases, potentially fatal risks in swallowing. Uh, so there's a list of, list of requirements there. These are uh, technically sophisticated products. Is perhaps the simplest way of looking at these things. Thickeners, which are often starch based, are used to provide confidence of the flow characteristics in liquid foods. If you click on the x ray image here, it'll take you through to a, a video of how swallowing works, uh, plus some comments from the company that makes this particular resource. You may not want to watch the video all the way through, but the swallowing, the swallowing part of it is particularly interesting. Uh, so, the ITSI framework, talking about dysphagia and linking through to dietetics. Uh, the ITSI framework, International Dietary uh, Dysphagia Standards Institute framework, provides a common terminology to describe food textures and drink thicknesses. It's got a, a continuum of eight levels, uh, zero through seven, where drinks are measured in levels zero to four, while solid foods are measured in levels three to seven. Uh, if you look at the image, it'll give you some full background, and there's another picture on the next page. Uh, so I if you think about this, somebody perhaps who's had a problem which is getting better might start at a, a low IDC number and then increase back eventually to solid foods. Someone who perhaps because of issues associated with age and is going the other direction would be perhaps moving down the IDC framework. And there's a summary of the latest version so uh, those who are interested might want to have a look at this if you're doing interviews for dietetics, mass and things like this, this may be the sort of thing that you could uh, positively talk about. Okay, so here's some results. Um, for adhesive force and adhesion for a dysphagia foods, as mentioned earlier on, these are whether the food sticks in people's mouths, sticks to surfaces such as the palate. 
Uh, if it's not very clear in the presentation or the video, click on the image to open a pu Tableau public resource. Note the wide variety in some ingredients, but not others. This, can, of course, can have significant implications for food safety with respect to retaining a, a given IDC level. Uh, hospitals rarely have proper kitchens these days. Uh, they don't often even have ovens, just microwaves. And the locations where these meals are regenerated may be a long way from where the patients are with potential impacts on the texture of foods for dysphagia. So for more background, click on the various images, including links to a northeastern company, which we have links to, who have a big impact in this market. Hopefully we'll maybe get the MD to do a resource on this bit later in the year. Uh, so here's an example of an experiment, including an IDC level of uh, a meal, a particularly IDC level, for example, level 5 here. Uh, so all parts of the meal must be level 5 after cooking. Each of the ingredients must have the same texture level, whether it's done by microwave or traditional oven. So the question we were asking in this experiment, and we'll hopefully come back to this in semester 2, is, is this true? Um, this is exper a broad experimental method to determine these, these issues. Uh, identical meals are regenerated by the two methods and their textures measured over time, plus various aspects of safety, of course. Uh, some more details of the methods. Um, pretty clear what's going on here, I think. Uh, so some student results from last year. So the table here summarizes the changes in adhesive force in several meals regenerated by the two methods with addition measured immediately after regeneration and 15 minutes later. So after 15 minutes later, for example, in this case, uh, the adhesive force has increased by 2.5 grams. Uh, and there's a list of the various meals that we used. Uh, so we'll notice a wide variety. There's quite a lot of change here. In some cases, there were quite a big difference in adhesion uh, in a positive direction, becoming more adhesive, so potentially producing a change of IDC level in other cases, becoming less adhesive, again changing the IDSI level, but perhaps less dangerously so. Uh, and again, this is for adhesiveness, and we'll, again we'll notice a similar pattern here. A uh, lot of variability in these results suggests the need for more work in this area. I think it's something we'll want to look at in the future. Okay, so other methods for completeness. Uh, the relevant group for the OBR should note that these topics are not included in the open book resource. How succulent is your fruit? A succulometer will tell you. Uh, the device works by basically taking a sample of food and compress it, compressing it and collecting the liquid produced. So it's not a fantastically accurate method, but it's good for the industries that use it. Uh, a penetrometer. Is a device used to test the strength of a material. They have many applications, including for food. If you see the video linked here, uh, I'll give you uh, much more information on how penetrometers work. Um, tendrometers, they all have good names, these things. Uh, these also have other applications, but they're often used to measure the, the stage of maturity of peas to determine whether they are ready for cropping. Uh, the device basically measures the force required to affect a shear reaction. Again, click on the image for a video link. Uh, and again, a reminder that none of these methods are needed for the OBR. Okay, and then there's a review coming up of the various things, which I'm not going to record for the video. Right, okay, thanks for listening.